All right, welcome back. Um, this is our last session of this series. Um, this is the very last video of Mass and Storytelling and Spark AR. Um, I'm Ashley Jane Lewis, and this is for the CoLab. And today's session is all about Mass as Disguise. So this session is a little bit different than the ones that we've done in the past. So for the previous three videos, I've given you a topic or a way of looking at Mass. Um, I've showed you some references. You've created a story and drawn a mask, and we've taken a slice of that and you know, turned it into a Spark AR filter. Um, this session is all about subverting Spark AR filters. So uh, in this video, we're gonna talk a little bit about facial recognition and the problems with facial recognition, the issues, and look at some artists who are using their creativity to gain back power and access from technologies that surveil them and use facial recognition to collect data without consent. Um, so uh, for this session, you need um, Spark AR. You also need a text, uh, a, a coding uh, text interface. So you could use Atom or Sublime or Virtual Studio, and you also need some craft materials. So you can use paper and scissors and tape if you want to, or you could use sticky notes like I'm doing right now. Those are basically the same thing. So uh, grab those materials. And first we're going to jump into um, some examples. And so again, all the examples today are about subverting it. So that means like really looking at the technology critically and asking ourselves how we can use creativity to disrupt the norm of what's taking place, but also create conversation around like why we want to use technologies like this. So let's get started with these examples. Okay, so this is the first example I wanted to show you. Um, it's entitled, How Beauty is Being Used to Fight Back About Facial Recognition Against Facial Recognition. So the description is, as surveillance technology becomes more intrusive, artists are exploring different ways to obscure the five points of recognition, the forehead, the nose, each cheek and the chin with makeup, hair and more. So, you know, this is what we're hoping to like roll towards a person who understands how facial recognition works, a person who understands how to build the software, because once you know how to build the software, you really understand how this to, to destructure or, you know, disrupt the software. And then uh, working towards how you can ensure that that knowledge allows you to gain back power to gain back privilege to get to gain back access and so um we have our uh we have a whole bunch of examples here that i think are really interesting including this artist um uh which is uh i think a really interesting example of how technology and physical objects can change this is the dazzle club so the dazzle club as you can see here, uses face makeup and hair to confuse facial recognition. So in theory, fingers crossed, I mean, technology advances so quickly that some of these things become out of date and then the method has to be updated, et cetera, et cetera. But in theory, you would try your face filter on some of these um, images and it wouldn't work. Um, obviously there are some that it would work, like obviously this would probably work on these two depictions of this artist, but the idea is that on some of these artists with like different kinds of makeup, it would not necessarily work. So the hope for this artist is that they would walk through a public area and not have facial recognition pick up or collect data on their movement. So the idea is to just be able to like reclaim some privacy that gets lost when you work, uh, when you, when you're living the world like we do, where so much surveillance and so much uh, facial recognition is collecting data. So um, they go on these night walks um, where they try to avoid collection of data as they go. So um, let me just show you a short video on what their process and thought uh, thought is, and this is from BBC News. Once you start to notice the cameras, they are everywhere. That weird feeling of someone following you. Our patrons are the data that they be collected by it. These cameras are red coming, taking some control back. The last walk we did 
gentleman came up to us and asked me if we were part of the tribe, <laughs> which I thought was quite funny because then I suppose there is that reference to kind of warping and mm. tribal. of your face. So the idea is to use geometric shapes, different colours, bright and dark, to abstract the main features. Most people just kind of get on with it and they think that it's a necessary kind of part of being a member of society. It's used when you unlock your phone or your computer, so on Instagram and on Snapchat when you use face filters. It's an increased kind of society which is so surveyed and so controlled by police forces. It just seems to slip into everyday life as the new, the new norm. Okay, so that's an example of the Dazzle Club. There's also other examples out there, like um, this beautiful depiction, um, Mother Protect Me. They're femme makeup application artists who are trying to use objects to obscure facial recognition so they have these beautiful flower arrangements and so their objective here is really to like lean into uh femininity and and some of the other things that exist in that in that um, definition as it is stated traditionally and so they create these masks out of flowers so you know uh it's one thing to think about like um facial recognition for like filters that have shapes and like fun masks and things like that. And that's one, definitely one mode of creative application. But what happens when facial recognition is used for other kinds of things? What happens when facial recognition is not used for like creating sounds when you open your mouth and for fun, but also used for moments of like determining decisions based on the law? Um, for instance, we have an example here also from BBC News, um, that outlines IBM's decision to abandon biased facial recognition technology. So they've found uh, through studies that suggest that facial recognition algorithms are less accurate in identifying African American faces. So, you know, this is really troubling when a black person or like, you know, a brown person or, or somebody whose uh, skin tone is not white tries to do things that are simple like unlock their phone and it's like that's troubling enough already but as we get closer to a world where like banking is related to facial recognition or access into buildings is related to facial recognition or much more concerningly um law and like being uh, arrested or being um, when your identity and whether you've committed a crime is related to facial recognition that is so bad at determining accurately who whose face they're looking at when it's not a white individual then we have like a lot of worries a lot of concerns a lot of issues and this is not just an issue for people who are african-american but also for people who are uh, female as well um, transgender non-binary and there's another artist uh, uh, she calls herself a poet of code joy uh, bula Weenie, and she researches and explores how social impact and technology and inclusion are interconnected. So her research is um, on uh, many major AI tech company services like Microsoft, IBM, Amazon, and her goal is always to think about how these biases impact the lives of people of color and women. And she's unveiled that an enormous amount of bias exists in racial and gender uh, demographics categories for AI services, meaning that major AI services for huge companies that service like millions of people across the world do not work or work unreliably or work very poorly on people of like racial diversity or gender diversity. So, you know, it's, it's just, there's, 
there's a spectrum of all of this. There's a spectrum between where we, um, you know, work towards creating a, a space where we're thinking about like the fun and like creative applications of the technology, but we also have to think about what potential you know, harm or challenges that technology could create for different people across the world. And as creative technologists in this spectrum, we, we think along these gaps and we, and we try to like disrupt and create conversation around these topics. Um, but those are all the examples I wanted to show you today. So uh, we're gonna go back out of this and talk about the task for today. Um, and uh, then we'll use Spark AR. Okay, so hopefully those examples gave you uh, a sense of what we're trying to think about today. Um, I hope that they inspired you creatively, but also inspired like a greater sense of criticality around facial recognition. And so when you look at this list, this list we've been building all session long about what our computer knows about us through Spark AR, um, just think about how important it is for an AR software to have this information. So without understanding the silhouette of our body, for instance, the outline of our body, how would facial recognition software, even creative ones like Spark AR, how would it separate our body from the background? You know, how would our, uh, without understanding the like dimensions of our face and our head, how would facial recognition software be able to like map a graphic to our face. When we ask questions like this and we look at our list of everything our computer knows about us, we start to see how tied these two things are, like data collection and um, facial recognition software or augmented reality are, are really tied together. And so I want you to think about like, now that you have this knowledge, just like these artists, of what facial recognition needs, how can you disrupt that or you know, creatively subvert that so that you can gain greater access of expression, but also make it more difficult for cameras and facial recognition to be able to collect data on you. So let's take the silhouette, um, for example, like the silhouette of our body. So we know that in order to do filter effects, like the one where your background color is different than the color and like structure of your body, that um, we have that body segmentation code that runs inside of Spark AR that understands and tries to map the outline of our body. So if we know that as artists, what can we do to shift and change the structure and the outline of our body so that it's more difficult for facial recognition software to get an accurate data sam sample of that outline? So um, what materials in your real world could you adorn to your body to change the, the, the silhouette? And so, you know, Facial recognition software is updating all the time and getting more advanced all the time. And when we're, you know, artists who are trying to think about these things cr critically, we have to like update our processes all the time too and think about what situations we are okay with having data collected and which situations we want more privacy and less surveillance. And, and you know, most importantly, which situations we aren't even being asked if we, if we want, like what, when are we not getting a choice? And so, the more that we play with these things and like, you know, break them down and subvert them and think about them deeper than just using filters, the better we can be at, you know, changing systems, changing conversations, holding more power um, and, and creating more access to this kind of content. So today is all about using materials in your physical space to create a mass. And I would just want to, I want you to think about what you might what you might do, like let's imagine you have all the craft supplies in the world, what kind of like physical mass you might make that would make it harder for Spark AR to launch their virtual filters. And once you understand what might break a Spark AR filter, you might also be able to like trigger an eye effect over here on like a cardboard mask or trigger a background effect in like a small quadrant of the screen instead of the full background. Like it, you know, Disrupting things also opens up greater creativity as well, right? Um, so yeah, let's get into the Spark AR, AR software and then um, we'll see what we can do.
Okay, share. Okay, so this is our last filter of the module of our collab Spark AR session. And uh, let's just jump right into it. So remember today's filter is all about like subverting the face filter. So we're gonna create something and then we're going to try and break it. So uh, I wanna show you a few more skills and then we can get to our breaking activity. Um, the first thing I want to show you is aligned with what we did last time, which is our scripting um, related to the mouth openness. So um, let's go uh, into the software. The first thing we need to do before we can get to scripting is I want us to look at one new object that we haven't added before. Um, in order to work with our mouth openness, the first thing we need to grab is our face tracker. There's our face tracker. And while we're clicked on the face tracker, we wanna add a new object, something we haven't seen before. And this object is called a plane. So the plane is a three dimensional version of a rectangle. You can see if you hover over it, you get some more details. Essentially it is uh, the same as rectangle, except it can also be in the 3D world. So rectangles are really pinned to our, our camera screen. So they're only two dimensional but a plane is three dimensional. So it can also experience controls and positions and scales from the Z axis. So let's insert one of those and, uh, oh, wait. Here we go, try again, plane. There we go. And uh, you can see just like before with our camera and our speaker, we have these axes that we can pull in different directions and move and rotate. Um, so now that we have our plane, uh, we can give it a material. So we can go into the material section, give it whatever material you'd like. Uh, you can also just change the color if that's what you want. I think I'm going to change my material to the star, which I know you have all seen before. Great. And uh, you can also move your plane to whatever location you want it to exist in. Maybe you want it to exist there on your eye. I don't know. In a second, we'll be able to change the position of the, um, of the star um, so that it follows our face. But that's what we want to do for now. Um, let's just save our file before we go any further. Culture Hub Module 4. Okay, so in order to make our script to do a little coding, we go back down to the assets area, add script. And remember you can um, just, you can just hit enter here or double click this to open it or you can go over here and you can hit edit. And it should open. Takes a second, there we go. And uh, this section, let me close some of these other ones. Um, so in our, uh, in our module, we have, um, in our script rather, we have a whole bunch of things. As I said to you before, we're just gonna like get rid of all of them. This is what I said last time. I think I said after line, after a certain particular line, but we're just gonna get rid of everything today. Okay. So um, now we're going to start coding. It's not too many lines. It's pretty self-explanatory, which is great. This is an example that you can find online pretty easily, but it's going to help us be able to allow you to go and search for like more details when you want to script a little further. So the first thing we want to do is um, we're going to create a constant. That's a variable type. And we're working with the face tracking um, functionality today. So we're going to require the face tracker. And I'm going just a little faster because we talked a lot about this last time. And we end all of our, um, all of our lines with a semicolon. I'm just giving it a little space here so you can read it a little easier. And then we're also working with the scene. Last time we had some buggy issues with the scene um, function in the code. So we'll see how this works. 
Um, great. And so we also want to add some lines of code that help us understand to how we like go about finding all of the components in the scene. So last time we had um, something that looked for, uh, what was it? It was finding the mesh network, I think. I can't remember. But um, this time we want to create uh, something that's looking for our plane. Find first, and we're looking for the plane. And our plane is called, let me go check. Our plane is called plane zero. So we can call this plane zero, and then we can um, put this inside of another function. So we want to be able to take all the functions we're about to do and have them trigger at any time, which means we need to put them inside of an asynchronous, uh, an asynchronous loop. So got our asynchronous function here. And this helps us, asynchronous is a term we use in order to talk about how um, our computer can do any of the following elements without uh, doing them in chronological order. So it can be called, any part of what we're about to write can be called at any time, which is really exciting. Um, so uh, inside of this asynchronous, um, I guess I can explain that a little more. So synchronous coding is we uh, write a line of code and the computer executes each line of code one after the other moving down the sequence. Asynchronous coding allows for the computer to jump between lines and uh, uh, execute any of the events or the, um, you know, the things, the instructions at any point, which is really a lot handier. So let's say, for instance, your parent or your teacher makes you a schedule that says, uh, first you go to gym class, then you go to math class, then you go eat lunch, then you do this. That's like a, a synchronous schedule, right? But on the weekend, you probably have like an asynchronous schedule where you're like, oh, today I want to like skateboard and I also want to watch TV and I also want to take a nap and I also want to make a snack. And you can do those in any particular order. So the functions that we're working with are all about our plane. So we're going to tell it that um, we want for our plane to be able to await and receive any of the um, functions that we're writing. So there's a lot of syntax in this, which is exciting things to see and learn. So just follow along with me until we get through it and I will talk about what all of these things mean. Okay. So I think we have everything so far that we need. So we have our asynchronous function and inside of that asynchronous function, we have our constant, which is the plane. Um, our plane, as we saw, is this star, the plane that um, can be three dimensional as well as two dimensional. And for all of the functions we're about to write, we want our scene, we want our computer program, our Spark AR program, to first go find the plane tracker in the scene and then execute all of these different functions. So now that we're done that, we're going to uh, put another line of code that tells us, um, that creates a variable called face that we can use throughout the program. And our face is made up of the face tracking app, the face tracking um, you know, applications or uh, functionalities in the code. And it's looking for face zero. So there's only one face that we are, um, that we are tracking today and it's attached to face tracker zero, it's face zero as well. If we had like a, a piece of code that could work for multiple people, then it would be like looking for face zero and for face one and for face two. The funny thing about coding is when we count, we usually start at the number zero when we're trying to like count um, how many things are in a, in a scene. We also want to be able to create a variable that allows us to transform the plane. 
So we have our variable, let's call it plane transform. And that's going to be a combination of our plane and the transform functions in our code. Um, and let's do another variable also called face transform. That allows for future functionalities that might allow us to transform objects based on the camera position and what it detects about our face. This one is all about the mouth openness. So this one you'll recognize, our mouth openness variable. And if you remember to last time, our mouth variable, our mouth openness variable follows a train of commands starting with the face, then moving to the mouth, and then tracking the openness. I'm going to come back to this line. So that line is, oops, not quite done. Okay, so now here comes the best part. We're going to change the scale of our plane based on the openness of our mouth. So we have our plane transform function or a variable. And we want to change the scale of the X location or the X dimension. I'm gesturing with my hands, but you can't see it. We just want to change the scale of the X dimension and the Y dimension based on how wide open our mouth is. So there's our plane transform scale X. And we just, we're just going to make it equal to the mouth openness. And we've got our plane transform for the scale of y. And that's also open to the mouth, uh, related to the mouth openness. Um, and then we just have to close our code with all of our brackets. Cool. And the last piece, oh, that's weird. And we just have to change, uh, close our code with all of the brackets. Okay. Cool. And the last part that we want to do is we want to learn how much we want to multiply our um, multiply our uh, our plane by when we open our mouth. So we don't want to scale it exactly because those numbers don't really like translate to anything interesting. But we can multiply the the value of our um, mouth openness to a number that would help make our graphic grow or shrink dramatically. So if you remember to yesterday or the last, um, um, I keep saying yesterday, but the last time we made a video and, and worked through that tutorial, uh, our mouth openness was a number between zero and one. So if we were to use that for the scale, it wouldn't be very interesting because our widest our mouth would be would only like change the scale by like 0 0.7, it would, it would actually make the graphic smaller. But if we multiply that number so that the mouth openness really like creates a dramatic number, then that allows for a scale to grow really, really large and then shrink really small when our mouth is closing. So maybe we can multiply it by like five or six. And we can also tell it how big or what ratio we want it to um, be at when we add it to the screen, um, to the scene rather. So that's what the add is. And I'll show you what that looks like when we change it a little bit. So now we just need to save this. So I just hit save on my keyboard, but you can also go to file save. And here we go. Let's 
see. We have a little glitch here, so I must have a spelling mistake. Let's go back here. Let's try that. Clear this. Still have a little spelling mistake. Oh, here it is. There we go. Um, so if you saw that, I just like accidentally capitalized this F. So if you did that too, you can go back and make that a lowercase F. Okay. So now <laughs> as I'm talking, you can see the star is growing and shrinking. So um, remembering our mask is about disguise, you can think about how um, you might want to create disguise as you're um, building this mask, even though we're trying to break it, thinking about how we might like obscure parts of the face, obscure parts of the um, body to be able to change the, uh, to change the way that we look. Um, I'm just realizing that my star is not following my face. It's like stuck in the middle. So I just need to grab the plane of the star and put it underneath face tracking. There we go. So now um, our plane follows the star. Our plane follows the face rather. And I can change the position so that it's less on my nose and closer to my eye just by dragging this over. There we go. So now it should follow my eye and then also be shifting based on how wide open my mouth is. Cool. So um, great. Now we want to do a couple more details. I wanted to show you a few more things before we try to break our filter. <laughs> Um, oh, one more thing I'll show you is what happens when we change some of these numbers. So um, inside of our script, we have number, we have our star being multiplied by five in order to like create a dramatic effect. If I like multiplied that by 10, you can see, as I'm sure you could probably guess, let's let the Spark AR update. If I open my mouth wide, like I just did, <laughs> the star gets super, super, super big. Now our star is still starting on our eye in the original size that we uploaded it to be, but you can change that as well by changing the number inside of the ad. So instead of um, a number like uh, one, which is like uh, multiplying the size by one, which is basically replicating it, you can multiply it by half, and you'll get a smaller starting star. There we go, see, it's little. Um, I'm gonna center it a little more. Now that it's small, you can really see where the center point is. Cool, you can even um, create it to be a little bit smaller, like, if you wanted a smaller number, like quarter of the size of its original form, you can save that. This will update and it becomes really little. And you could even, you know, think about like making it so small that you can't see it when you begin and you only see it when you open your mouth, which would be kind of cool. Um, all right, so I wanted to show you a few more skills that you can apply. We haven't looked at 3D shapes yet, so um, I wanted to show you 3D shapes unless you want, in case you wanted to make a mask um, about, 3D, about uh, 3D shapes or with 3D shapes. So it's really simple, which is exciting. So inside of the add asset section, we want to go search the library and you can get 3D shapes online as well. Um, let me show you these 3D shapes first. So 
inside of the 3D objects section, there's a whole bunch that are just listed here, but then you can also get um, interesting shapes here from the shape category. You can get, there's a whole glasses category. Um, there is a food category. If you wanted to upload food, there's an animal category, like really whatever you, th whatever is interesting to you. Um, we're just going to work with a basic 3D shape today. I like the dodecahedron. So I'm going to import that. Cool. And now my dodecahedron is down here in the assets folder. Um, I can change the I can add it to the scene by just dragging it up. I really want it to be related to my face tracker, I think. So I'm gonna drag it, oops, this one, drag it up here. And that's, I just made a little mistake um, in case you made that too. So there's two kinds of dodecahedron files that show up in your assets. There's the material version, which remembers like the skin or the way that it looks, the color or the texture. Um, for instance, like I can make this dodecahedron um, have our galaxy, um, our galaxy background. But the material is not the same as the object. So the 3D object is what you want to drop onto your scene. So I'm going to grab that object and I'm going to put it, I'd like it to be associated to the face tracker too. So there's my, <laughs> there's my dodecahedron. You can see if I come closer to the camera, it's attached to my nose, it's here. Um, so I'm going to, and it does have the galaxy print, which is exciting. Um, okay, so I'm going to make some adjustments to my dodecahedron. I'm going to open it up in the face tracker and I'm going to click on the um, file within it. And now I'm going to look at the properties. So um, I would really like to make it uh, not on my nose. So I can drag the arrows in the viewfinder in the um, down here in the display. I can drag these arrows so that it changes the position and I think also be cool to have it on my eyes. Thinking about uh, uh, obfuscation or disguise or you know hiding yourself, this is you know maybe what can guide you to thinking about your size and position of all of these objects. So I want it to be a little bit bigger so I'm going to change the scale to be three times the size and now I'm looking at that and I'm like wow it's pretty big maybe two, two times the size. Cool so now I have this dodecahedron on my face um, I can even submerge it in my skin a little bit if I wanted to. You can see it kind of like going inside and behind the camera. Um, so you could do that. You can change the position, but this is, this is basically, I might move it over like a little bit so that the star can still be seen. Cool. So now we have the ability to like layer. You can add more 3D objects if you want to. So you can just add another 3D asset. Um, I did want to tell you where else you can get 3D objects. So let me make sure I do that before this is over. 3D object, and we can go get another shape, like maybe, what else is cool? I like this one too. Same deal. So now we have our osasahedron probably pronouncing that wrong. Um, but I'm going to add that to the scene. Again, it shows up in my nose area, um, but I can drag it around. Maybe a little lower. Change the scale. Um, give it a skin back in the materials. Texture, maybe just the space background. Yeah, so you can see how it becomes pretty cool as you like layer these objects. It becomes really interesting um, as to how we might go about creating some kind of like depth and texture. And all of a sudden I have like this geode kind of growing out of my face, which is really cool. Um, you can go online and get some, uh, 
you can get some 3D models as well. Um, let's see. So uh, you can go to Thingiverse. I don't know if, um, if you've ever heard of Thingiverse before, but Thingiverse is a really cool 3D model website. Think of it as like Google image search, but for 3D models. And you can go and grab 3D models, like there's a whole bunch in here, um, and import those as well into Spark AR, which is really cool. So let's say you wanted to like add a cat, you would just search cat, just like you would 3D, um, just like you would in a Google image search. You're gonna get all kinds of different kinds of cats. And you can work towards importing some of these files to your Spark AR as well. Um, okay, so that's what I wanted to show you. Um, oh, there's one more thing I thought would be cool for you to learn. I wanted to show you how you could um, create some uh, interaction based on the uh, patches and how they might affect, how those patches might affect the objects that you have now just like mounted to your face. So I thought maybe we could look at some of the like facial oriented interactions. So um, since we're doing face patch editing, we're going to go to the face tracker. Create a patch, and we've got our face finder patch now. And um, let's do one of the things that come with our um, face interaction. So you have all these different kinds of face interactions, which is kind of bizarre, right? Because we've got like things like um, things that are normal, like maybe like the right eye closing or the left eye closing or the mouth opening, but we also have these like strange like facial expressions like our um, happy face. And I just want you to think for a second like <laughs> how the computer might know that you're happy and maybe the computer knows that you're happy based on like the rotation of your mouth and maybe like what else changes when our like our cheeks get higher we know that there's in terms of face landmarks we know that there's like cheek chin eyeball eyebrow eyelid forehead nose i'm sure you've done a little digging and seen these before and so we know that these are the like data points for the face but when you think about the interaction like how does the computer know that you're happy just because of the way perhaps your cheeks raise or you're like thinking about what happens when our when we're happy like when we smile like i guess our eyes might squint a little bit because our cheeks are raised because we're smiling which forces all our muscles upward but but it is it is bizarre that the computer is sure that those particular muscle organizations mean that you're happy because our facial expression doesn't always tie to what we're feeling on the inside so it is strange to be seeing these kinds of things you just really like you know it's 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 fine to think about like blinking blinking isn't tied to emotions um not as it's defined here or just the, the sheer detection of your eyebrows raising or lowering. But once we start to think about that in relation to like emotions, it becomes very complicated because people are not experiencing the same emotions using the same kind of facial muscles. muscles. <laughs> Especially when you think about different cultures across the world, people express things so differently um, that it becomes, you know, curious and perhaps maybe you know, um, unreliable to determine that what a what a like kissing face looks like for everybody, or what a um, surprised face looks like for everybody. Um, and when we use those filter, when we use those functions in a in a software like this, and tell like let's say you have a filter that's like the surprise face will do this. I mean, <laughs> it is kind of like forcing or, or encouraging your user to be surprised at a, in a particular way. And I just wonder what that does over time um, when people are being like, you know, encouraged to look surprised in order to trigger filters or to trigger facial effects. Like what does that change over time about the way we express 
feeling surprised. Just something to think about. So um, we're going to avoid some of these emotional ones and we're just going to look at like, let's do like the right eye closing. Maybe like, I guess it could be a wink. You could tie it to the left eye closing as well. Um, so when we, I want to just show you what will happen. Like if you were to use like some of these body, these facial expressions or sorry, these facial features as switches. So let's say I want to turn on and off this geode based on my eye closing. Um, so it's like a little wink or like perhaps you could do like a blink and your geode could turn off and on. Um, I wanted to just show you what you how you would do that in case like in this disguise filter you want to be able to like use your face to like initiate the disguise and then use your face again to like hide the disguises that you're building so uh we have our right eye closing um we want to take our face tracker let's like remind ourselves of all the different outputs we've got face 3d position 3d scale 3d rotation we can tie face to to the eye uh, right eye closed patch and then um we want our let's start with the dodecahedron we want the dodecahedron to disappear and we've done something similar-ish to this before. So you might have already guessed that we need the visible patch. So we're going to go to the visible feature inside of the inspector of dodecahedron. We're going to click the yellow arrow. And now we have the dodecahedron visible patch. And the last thing we want to do, if we're looking at these eye, this eye closing as like a switch, we want to go get the switch. patch. Now the great thing about our, um, and we're going to connect it to the face, to the dodecahedron, and the great thing about our right eye closing patch and the switch patch is that uh, in theory this is what we want, but we're going to get this great pulse patch that's going to help us be able to navigate and switch that signal. So we looked at the pulse patch last time. So now we should be able to um, and you can already see it happening. As I'm blinking, just naturally, look over here, our dodecahedron is disappearing and reappearing based on my blinks. We can do the same thing to the isosahedron. So if we go to the isosahedron and hit the file within it, go to the visible function, we go and then we just tie that to it as well and before you know it now our whole geode blinking pretty quickly our whole geode turns off and on with these blinks which is pretty uh pretty exciting um yeah so that should be happening for you too now which is cool Okay, so now that we have some filters to play with, which is great, we've got some things going on. The whole goal of today is to break your filter based on what we know about the filter. So now that we understand we have like a kind of like a catalog running in our head of what our computer knows about us and where it's tracking data and where it's pulling data and we want to subvert some of those things by thinking about just like our inspiration um, how we might disguise our physical bodies in order to like subvert facial recognition. So I have all of these sticky notes as I mentioned at the top of my video. Um, I've got some pink ones, I've got some green ones, some blue ones, and the goal for you now is just to try to um, break the filter with physical disguise. So I'm just gonna, because I can't tell if I'm breaking it or if I'm blinking our filter away. I'm just going to disconnect some of these lines in our patch so that when I blink my um, dodecahedron and isosahedrons don't disappear. Um, okay, so with physical structure, just like we saw in the um, example, we want to like take a sticky note and like add it to our face and see if that breaks the filter. Okay, so the top of my, I just added a filter, uh, a sticky note to the top of my cheek, and um, uh, maybe if I lean out, oh yeah, you can see here, you can see it here. 
that chief is not affecting the assured or the, the the data of our filter so let's try the other cheek the goal is to layer as many of these as possible on your face taking a guess at where our face tracking data is pulling from to see how much disguise tricks our filter into into losing its functionality let's see if the mouth is important Okay, so the mouth doesn't change anything. Oh, oh, it's starting to freak out. You can see it's starting to freak out a little bit. Um, I'm gonna put a photo of what my face looks like on the screen. Oops. So it's starting to lose its ability to track where we are. I don't want to like go straight up and like, obviously if I put a sticky note on my eye, it's going to like not understand my eye, but I'm just wondering how much other data it needs. Now I'm covering my nose. It doesn't understand my face much anymore. Oh, it really doesn't understand. Okay. I think we found it. So the funny part about this is that, let me take these off so I can talk to you. The funny part about this is that it actually isn't related to your eye at all where your eyes are. So what does that mean about the face tracker for eye recognition? What does it need in order to understand where your eyes are? It needs more than just your eye data points because without the rest of these data points, your eyes are just too, you know, dark circular or whatever blue, green, whatever color your eye is, too circular structures in the world. But attached to a nose and a mouth, an object that is like centered and lower than the eyes and like a longer, narrower, like horizontal object, now the face tracker understands these elements together to be a face. So it doesn't understand these things as individual objects but rather as like connected objects so now what does our face filter understand about us so keep playing with this see how see how little you need on your face to be able to confuse your filter and try with other things like we tried it with sticky notes if you are a person who enjoys makeup you can try it with makeup if you um I don't know, have washable marker. You could try marker depending on what your, you know, guardians or parents think about that. Um, you could try disguising yourself with different kinds of like fabrics or paper or whatever you have lying around. Maybe even looking at things that are like slightly more transparent than others. Um, so like how much opacity does your filter need? And yeah, use this to start to understand like how much information your a computer needs to understand you as a person, um, not emotionally, but like as an object defined as a person. Uh, so yeah, that's the goal. The goal is to build filters. You can change the technology, use anything that we've learned in the last three sessions. The goal is to like create a filter, and as maybe as elaborate as you want, and then break it with physical objects. Disguise yourself to break your filter. Um, so keep playing with that. Take some photos and <laughs> figure out what it needs, what it understands, when it breaks. And yeah, that's it for today. Just all about subverting the face filter. Okay, that's it. That's the whole thing. That's the whole, <laughs> that's the whole series and session. Um, so I hope you learned a whole bunch about creativity and some curiosity around a new software and really importantly, some new methods of engaging with criticality. And I'm just really glad that you spent the time to learn about all these things. Thank you so much. Thanks to the collab. This has been really great. And uh, that's it. I hope you keep making filters and I hope you keep disrupting filters. Thanks.